This video is brought to you by the Razer Blade 15 laptop. I actually used this laptop as part of the review process for this video, so stick around to the end of the video to hear how Doom Eternal runs on it. Spoiler alert, it runs pretty damn well. Here's a headline. Adult industry calls for shutdown. Turns out an industry built on exchanging bodily fluids isn't essential business, though at least they didn't have the audacity to try to pretend it was. So there you have it. On top of everything else, we can soon expect a global shortage of just great. Hey, good thing we have Doom. All right, so if I were earlier in my YouTube career looking to cut my teeth with some edgy analysis, I might have made some long and overwrought think piece on why I think Doom 2016 is a better game than Doom Eternal. Because I do think that. I do think that 2016 is this absolutely flawless masterpiece wrought of divine inspiration, while I think Doom Eternal actually casts aside some of the key lessons that Doom 2016 taught us and is slightly the worse for it. But we can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good, and even though I didn't enjoy many of the innovations that Doom Eternal brought to the table, this was still unquestionably one of the best first person shooter experiences I've ever had. When Doom is firing on all cylinders, bright red flames spewing six meters from its exhaust, tires wreathed in the smoke of burning rubber, the engine roaring so loud you can barely hear yourself think, Doom Eternal stops being a game and becomes a full-scale audio-visual sensory experience, like it was purpose-built to exhaust your adrenal glands in one fell swoop. Minor nitpicking around the edges of this needs to be taken as exactly what it is, minor nitpicking. Doom Eternal is the best shit you can be playing right now, and yeah, I'm calling you out, Tom Nook. Doom Eternal is the sequel to the seminal Doom 2016. Back then, Bethesda had a review policy where they didn't issue early review code, and given that the multiplayer test they ran was kind of balls, people held grave concerns for whether Doom 2016 would suck. Turns out it was essentially perfect. Returning to the roots of the franchise as a balls-to-the-wall action shooter, serving up the best, most optimized graphic engine we'd seen in years with id Tech 6, delivering a story and mythos in exactly the way a Doom game needed, while also having a soundtrack that was so good that it single-handedly revitalized the Christian rock genre. Doom Eternal essentially asks the question, how do you improve on perfection? The answer is, you can't. The best thing you can do is change around some elements of the formula and hope they don't suck. Spoiler alert, some of them suck. To start, there's been some work done on the basics of weapon and sound design. The pistol is gone, replaced with the shotgun as the base weapon, as it always should have been. Weapon models have all had a refresh, in particular the rocket launcher, which looks like it has this sort of thermal reactor at its core. The ballista, oh my god. I can't explain how awesome this thing looks, I, I want to marry it. What you'll notice pretty much right away is that there's been a complete redesign of weapon sounds. The shotgun sounds even media, which I didn't even think was possible. The heavy cannon sounds like a heavy cannon that you can somehow hold in your hands. Each round sonorously thunders, offset perfectly by the prattle of bullets moving into the chamber and the clarion ring of the spent casings being ejected and discarded at your armored feet. There's a quote from Luke Smith of Bungie which I'll always remember, and it's, we can make a weapon feel more powerful just by changing the sound of it. And in Doom, every single weapon sounds like some gunpowder-fueled variant of Molnir striking an anvil. Speaking of Bungie, I thought a lot about Destiny as I took in Doom's new worlds and spaces. Doom 2016 was essentially two spaces, the steeled interiors of the UAC on Mars, and then Hell itself. It was a straightforward, dare I say, grounded set of locations that all felt rather cogent, like they made sense for what this game was about, the story it was telling, and where things would naturally lead to next. Doom Eternal completely does away with this for both good and ill. On the plus side, Doom's environments look absolutely fucking sick.
Doom does what Destiny does and Star Wars before it. It fuses classic fantasy-inspired architecture with futuristic sci-fi technology. This is best on display with the Fortress of Solitude, which was for some reason called the Fortress of Doom. It's kind of a lame name to be honest. The Fortress is your safe space, a refuge from all the noise and the killing that is the Doom Slayer's 9 to 5. When Doom Guy wants to play Animal Crossing, he plays it here. The fortress is just that, a fortress, but shattered and suspended in space. It speaks to the duality that exists within Doom Eternal's design. Its lights, its consoles, its dashboards, and its force fields remind you that Doom has always been and will always be sci-fi, but the placement of its tech, chiseled into stone, set in wrought iron, adorned by gargoyles, it reminds us that Doom is just as much about the eternal battle between the ancient demonic forces of hell and the demigod that opposes them. This duality exists across Doom's many environments, though its extremities arc much wider than what we see in the fortress alone. Doom Eternal's levels are a broad and varied smattering of cityscapes and skyrise towers and converted hellscapes and native hellscapes and factories and space stations and monastic cathedrals. There's not a lot that links these spaces together. You teleport across limitless space in an instant from your fortress at the start of each mission, so it doesn't feel as contiguous as it did back in 2016. It's more variety, but it's also more whiplash inducing as you jump between locations like that fucking terrible scene in Rise of Skywalker. I mean, first we had the Holdo maneuver, and now we have whatever this is. Is nothing sacred anymore? Doom Eternal's environments lack the through line that the first game had, but they are unquestionably better environments. Bigger, more beautiful, less Warren-like, and more open. They more consistently push the player out of their comfort zone. It's much harder to hide and wait things out in Doom Eternal because the level design typically doesn't give you the chance to do that. With this change in architectural style comes a pretty significant change in the way the story is told. Doom 2016 was pretty loud and proud about the fact that Doom doesn't need cutscenes and bullshit to get in the way of killing demons. I mean, it's kind of one of the major lessons of that game. So it's really weird that id were like, fuck that, time for some cutscenes. You cannot kill the priests. You know our laws. Despite their transgressions against the government, they are still of sentinel blood. So we can't overblow this issue. There aren't many of them, but there are enough of them that you definitely notice the contrast to 2016. More than anything though, they don't really add anything. I was actually super down for this new approach to storytelling because I thought it would be cool to imagine the Slayer as descendant from an ancient order of Knights Templar with all of the lore and iconography and weapons and all that stuff, but it just doesn't quite work. Like, I really don't feel it in my jellies when they're saying all of the stuff. If this landed really well, I'd be okay with it, but given that it just sounds like a lot of verbal MacGuffins that we've heard a thousand times before, it cheapens Doom. It makes it feel like everything else. And Doom 2016 showed us that there was a way around that stuff that still achieved the same outcome, only with more verbal thrift. Sadly, this is a step back for the series, albeit a minor one. You know what else is a step back for the series? The platforming. Oh, I had a fucking jump pad that I couldn't use, man. Those kids were so fucking bad, dude. I'm so fucking gone, dude. I'm done with this game, man. It's so fucking bad. It's so bad, man. So again, let's not blow this out of proportion. Does it ruin Doom Eternal? No, it doesn't. Not even close. But again, it just doesn't add anything. You climb up walls awkwardly, you use monkey bars to propel yourself, you dash twice in the air to cross great distances. It's fine, but it's never fun. It's just there to provide pacing. Combat is so suffocatingly awesome all the time that we need moments to breathe, and Id clearly thought that utilizing the space between the various combat arenas would be the best means of slowing things down. They were right, of course. There should be downtime, and traversal challenges make a lot of sense. It's just that the style of traversal is so incongruent with the rest of the game. See, Doom Eternal isn't this dance of violence. It's not a ballet or a waltz or a salsa or a twerk. It's circus. De Soleil. It's dizzyingly fast and vertigo-inducingly aerial. The player utilizes all of these advanced movement techniques during combat to create fireworks in the sky, but when it comes time to do the platforming, these tools just aren't used intelligently. It feels so slow and static and plodding and 
buggy. I look at Titanfall 2's campaign, which so often took the advanced movement mechanics of that game and used them to terrific effect in environmental puzzles. I mean, the meat hook on the shotgun is basically the coolest, most fun thing I have used since the portal gun in Half-Life 2, and yet no traversal challenges make use of it. There could have been an entirely different approach to all of this platforming, which retains the focus on speed and fluidity. Slowly crawling up walls is not what I pictured the Doom Slayer to be doing in 2020. Environments, storytelling, platforming, each of these things are different from 2016, but their impact is fairly limited. What's changed considerably is combat, and it's changed in ways that some people are going to love and some people are going to hate, and I kind of sit somewhere in between. So the first thing you'll notice when you start playing Doom Eternal is that you are constantly out of ammo and you need to keep switching weapons. At first I was like, oh, what the fuck, this sucks, what have they done here, this isn't fun, etc, etc. I know a lot of people went through this arc when they started playing this game because it's such a massive change from 2016 that you sort of fight against it at first. You're like, if I want to use my shotgun all the time, well, I'll damn well use my shotgun all the time. Fuck you, id. Eventually, though, you realize two things. One, that just doesn't work and you better learn to adapt. And two, the chainsaw is a thing that exists. In Doom 2016, the chainsaw was sort of a last resort option to kill enemies for a guaranteed shower of health and ammo. You sort of kept fuel in it for reserve and only busted it out when it was needed, and that fuel didn't refill over time. You actually got most of your sustain just from glory killing regular enemies who would offer up the necessary health, armor, and ammo to keep things moving. In Doom Eternal, glory killing enemies doesn't net you that much, and you can't just melee trash mobs for free glory kills. Instead, you need to use your chainsaw way more regularly. It has one charge that constantly refills every minute or so. Ammo caps are also extremely low, on average less than half of what they were in 2016. So the intended flow of combat is to constantly exhaust all of your ammo pools by constantly switching weapons around and then refill your ammo once every minute with a chainsaw. So why is this good? It's good because you can't ride one or two weapons all the time like you probably did in 2016. It was so easy to get ammo back in that game that I could get away with using the super shotgun up close and the gauze cannon or rocket launcher from afar I was pretty much said. In Doom Eternal, it says, no, you won't do that. We made all these weapons, so you are going to use them. The player must use the right weapon against the right enemy. Otherwise, you're just not efficient enough to make it through to the next chance to refill your ammo. You're constantly switching weapons back and forward in a far more cerebral, intellectually demanding combat model. The game is also way harder because of this puzzle solving element. But here's the thing, right? A lot of people don't play Doom for a cerebral experience. They play it to shoot demons in the face with whatever weapon they damn well please. And these people don't like id telling them how to play their game. Personally, I'm kind of in between on this one. I think if the objective was to make a harder game, a more demanding game, then yeah, they totally nailed it. This game is definitely way harder than Doom 2016. I died so much more because I wasn't thinking enough. I was just pulling the trigger. We associate Doom with mindless shooting, but I guarantee you there will be YouTube videos in the future dissecting the on-the-fly puzzle solving that is this game's combat model and ammo economy. It's really, really well done. But I do think it's slightly overtuned, and it does force me into some negative patterns. Sometimes I might need my shotgun for more than 22 shells worth of enemies, but I can't use it because it's out of ammo, so I have to use something less effective or less fun. Perfect example are these enemies, which require the plasma rifle to be efficient against. Without those, taking them down is a lot harder and generally less fun. The tuning of the ammo caps is what pushes this system into uncomfortable territory, and I think that there's some space to tweak those numbers that still delivers on id's vision without the player feeling like they're constantly ammo dry and desperately reaching for things that they don't consider optimal or fun. The other big change is to the movement tools available to you, and holy hell, this is absolutely glorious. Doom Eternal keeps the double jump of 2016, but adds a double dash, allowing you to move in all directions quickly, including whilst in the air. You can combo this with new monkey bars, which are a bit slow and clunky, but they make for some really nice outplay potential in the arenas if you use them smartly. The real game changer though, is the meat hook on the super shotgun, and oh my fucking god, this thing is just... I don't have words for how much I love it. Switching to the shotgun to pull yourself halfway across the map to glory kill an enemy or launch yourself into the air to slingshot past them to completely reposition yourself in an instant. Oh my god. Uh, uh. Every single one of the best, most awesome, most satisfying moments I had with Doom Eternal, I had with the Meat Hook. It is so perfect. 
You know, I went back and played some Doom 2016 after completing Eternal, and I really liked how much freedom it gave me to just use the weapons that I wanted to use, but I really missed Doom Eternal's advanced movement mechanics. It was hard to go back now in absence of those, so whatever this franchise does next, I hope that these things stay intact. You know what I hope doesn't stay intact? These fucking guys. The main laboratory. So just as much as I can't put into words how much I love the meat hook, I also can't put into words just how much I hate Marauders. They are the only objectively terrible thing in the entire Doom franchise at this point. If I ever had the chance to interview Marty and Hugo again, the first question I would ask is, what the hell were you thinking with these Marauders? Okay, so let me explain. Marauders are an enemy that you meet about halfway through the game, and they pop up after that at random intervals. Most enemies in this game have one or two features baked into their kit, like the Arachnotrons, which can shoot you from afar with a turret, or they can melee you up close, and that's about it. The Marauders have a shotgun that they use if you get too close. They have a ranged attack that they use if you get too far away. They have a melee swing that they can bust out whenever the fuck they like. They have a massive gap closer. They run faster than a train. They summon a flaming dog that chases you if you don't engage them enough. Oh, and they are essentially invulnerable to most attacks because they can bring up their shield in a split second that will block hit scan attacks. You're meant to wait for this tiny opening when their eyes turn green and they're open to attack and you can really only trigger that if you're standing at a precise distance from them. Oh, and they're actually the one enemy in the game that the BFG does nothing against. So yeah, that's a lot in that kit. That's, that, that's a lot of stuff. There are lore reasons for this. They're meant to be really powerful, so I'm fine with that idea. There's a lot of people in the comments that are like, oh, just get good and shoot rockets to their feet and... No, it's not about them being hard. This is a hard game. I love that it's hard. I love getting my ass handed to me repeatedly in Doom. The problem isn't that Marauders are hard. The problem is they're bad. They're completely antithetical to the core design philosophy that underpinned Doom's entire combat design. Id had famously likened Doom 2016 combat to chess, where every piece on the board has a specific moveset and they combine these pieces in interesting ways. With this model, the player could eventually come to instinctively feel combat and move through it with a kind of graceful carnage. The Marauders completely arrest this flow. They demand your attention in a way that no other enemy does. The chess game is essentially put on hold until you deal with this asshole. More likely though, you'll do what I did, which is just run around ignoring them until everything else is dead, and then just 1v1 them while you slowly whittle down their health. It's so boring. And separate from their design intent, they just aren't well implemented. Like, they just feel so janky. The ideal distance that you're meant to be from them just feels so inconsistent. No other enemy in this game feels remotely janky, but the Marauders just feel like the contextual moveset is not consistent or reliable. They're not hard. Okay, they're a little bit hard. It's not that they're hard, they're boring. You could delete these enemies from the game and Doom Eternal immediately becomes a better video game. That's all I'll say on the matter. There are other small issues that creep in to upset this experience as well. The UI feels like a big step back versus the clean and mechanical UI of the previous game, and the constant tooltip spam should have died with Rage 2 when everybody said they hated it then, not brought forward here to Doom Eternal. I particularly hated it when they explained the mechanics behind every new enemy or boss and how to overcome them. Like, just let me figure that shit out for myself. I don't understand why this is needed. On the music, I really can't say yet what I think about it. The first time playing through this game is like the first time listening to the new Tool album. Like, are you going to tell me you knew what you thought about Fear Inoculum the first time you heard it? No, you didn't. With Doom 2016, it was a debut album. The soundscape was immediately fresh and overwhelming and incredible. You could fall in love with that immediately because you'd never heard anything like it. Here in Doom Eternal, we've heard it before, so it comes down to the individual merits of the tracks. I will say, it doesn't sound like a step back in the slightest, and so far I've enjoyed every bar I've heard. Mick Gordon continues to be a national treasure. That's right, he's Australian. He's ours, okay? We love him. Anyway, that's Doom Eternal. It's, uh, it's pretty amazing. It's pretty incredible. I absolutely love this game. I recommend it to you very, very, very strongly. But yeah, I have some problems with it. And some of those are fairly big problems. 
I think Doom Eternal struggles under the weight of the innovation imperative, and I'm not sure that it needed to burden itself with that to the degree that it did. Borderlands 3 was pretty much just better Borderlands 2, and people love that, myself included. Neo 2 has been praised for essentially being a better version of Neo 1. I mean, even The Outer Worlds was much praised for just being Fallout New Vegas, but in space. It's a tough thing to balance because artists naturally want to ideate, to improve. When you have something as perfect as 2016 was, the question of how to improve upon it is a daunting one, and it likely pushed it to pull levers and turn dials that would have been left well enough alone. Still, I value their commitment to push in the envelope and not getting complacent. With Doom Eternal, id continues to cement themselves as one of the greatest studios in the history of the medium, and like the Slayer himself, they're showing no signs of slowing down anytime soon. Hello! You're probably wondering why I'm here as opposed to my house. Uh, the thing is, I don't have my office anymore at my home. It's all packed away because we're moving house. So it's all in storage, which means I work during the day here, uh, and then I go home at night and do a little bit of work on a laptop. Uh, that was a bit rougher before than it is now because just this week, Razer sent me the Razer Blade 15 laptop, uh, which is... Uh, it's a pretty damn good laptop. I actually reviewed a third of Doom Eternal playing on this laptop. Uh, the footage that you're seeing on screen now was all captured on the Razer Blade 15. I got a very, very solid, like 120 frames per second while playing this thing uh, on ultra settings, mind you. And the funny story is that here in this office, I actually only have a 75 hertz monitor that I'm playing with. So it's actually better for me to play Doom Eternal on ultra settings on my laptop than it is for me to play it on my desktop PC right now. Which is ridiculous, but that's a true story. So that's that. In terms of the specs, you're looking at a 15.6 inch display with 4.9 millimeter thin bezels. Perfect for gamers and creators, they say, but it just makes it like a very skinny boy. It has a 240Hz refresh rate and 4K OLED resolution screen and I thought that the 240Hz would be overkill until I saw how Doom ran on this thing and then I was like well if you could do that with Doom imagine what you could do with like a you know less demanding game. It has a 9th gen Intel Core i7 6 core processor. It has a Nvidia GeForce RTX 2070 with Max-Q design in this so you can actually do ray tracing. I plan to play Half-Life Alex on this. I shit you not. That is what I'll be reviewing the upcoming VR title, Half-Life Alex. I'll be doing it on this because why not? I can just do that anywhere I like. Just plug it in in my laundry if I wanted to and just play it through this. That's what you can do. But look, it's like a seriously amazing piece of tech. Um, I am really blown away by it. I've been using it all week and it's fantastic. It's incredible, well beyond my expectations. Uh, the Razer Blade 15, check out the link in the description below. Thank you very much, Razer, for sending me this at exactly the right time. You've literally saved my life. Uh, not literally, that's not the right word, but you've really helped me out and I appreciate you. And thank you very much for watching the video, everyone. And, uh, ow, I got my finger caught then. Uh, I'll see you next time, bye-bye. Thank you.